Okay, perfect. And then we're going to start the stream over in Facebook as well. Okay. Jesse. Okay, we are live in Facebook. There we go. Almost there. Admito a Liz Memun porque es peligrosa, ¿no? Te estoy oyendo, hola. Yo te llevo oyendo como 15 minutos, Liz. <laughs> live, there we go. We're live on Facebook as well. Are we? Nice, okay. We have four viewers in, in Facebook and nine viewers here. Venga, si quieres ya ábrelo, ¿no? Que entren todos. ¿O qué se se ponen solitos ahí, no sé si cómo se abra automático. Aquí Igual, en el momento que alguien ve lo estoy metiendo, no te preocupes. Aquí, aquí le pongo. Le quito waiting room, ya. Yeah. ¿En dónde pones eso? And more, because they said ah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. waiting room and that's, that's it. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, it's almost seven. Pedro, cada vez tienes más tupida la barba. <laughs> Let's, let's give a couple of minutes so everyone can join. Uh, we have eight now here in Zoom and we have four in, in Facebook Live, so. I'm gonna share that live on Facebook. Okay, there we go. Hay gente pidiéndome en Zoom, pero no voy a dejar entrar. No, no vamos a dejar de entrar, me da mucha pena porque tuvimos unas unos problemas el día de ayer, que la gente entraba y empezaba a hacer este, tonterías, entonces... No, no vamos a dejar de entrar, me da mucha pena, porque tuvimos unas, unos problemas el día de ayer, que la gente entraba y empezaba... Oye doble. ¿Es un eco? Yeah. Albert, oye doble, Albert. Sí, voy, voy, voy. ¿Es el es live, is it the live feed from Facebook? Sí, yeah, that's, that's, that, that's why we hear double. What? Albert's taking care of that. Ahí está, ¿Ya está bien? Ya. Bueno, este, entonces estaba diciendo que en Facebook no vamos a pasar este, ya contraseñas. Y este, pues pueden hacer las preguntas a través de directamente en Facebook y aquí se las hacemos llegar a Eli. Con mucho gusto. Este, pues como estamos, 13, y tenemos 6, van entrando más. Qué poco soy comparado con ayer, eh. Ahorita se junta. Let's give them five more minutes. Sure. We'll start at like 7.05. We don't want anyone to miss anything. Ok. 
Okay, then we're going to start with the presentation. Uh, today is Eli Martinez. He's a famous shark whisperer. He worked in, uh, in Discovery Channel Shark Week and Nat Geo and a bunch of magazines. So he's surely a lot of, a lot of people know him. And he, he's uh, accepted our, our invitation to come and speak, well, talk about his shark encounters throughout his, uh, throughout his life. It's very interesting. Uh, I was uh, talking a little with, with him earlier, and uh, I don't. I want. I don't want to spoil everything. I want him to 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 talk for himself what he does. But first of all, I want. I want to uh, give. A, if you want to, if if you want to make a question, please raise your hand. We'll answer questions at the end of the talk and uh, one by one. In Facebook, anyone who's in Facebook, they can post their questions and I'll ask them directly to, to Eli. And, uh, well, thanks, Eli. Let me, let me say it in Spanish because we don't have a lot of... Uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, we're going to do this uh, the, with... Uh, Subtitles in, in, in YouTube in Spanish. So the ones who don't know English, they can see it tomorrow in Spanish. Now I'm going to do it in Spanish so for everyone to hear as well. Hola, buenas noches. Eh, Eli este, trabajó en Discovery Channel en Shark Week. Tuvo, de hecho, su programa en Discovery Channel por un tiempo. Y este, también... Trabajó en Geo, tenía un programa, tiene bastantes este, revistas. Bueno, es, tiene, es muy famoso, tiene muchas cosas. No quiero echar a perder la plática, quiero que él platique de él mismo. Nada más doy las reglas de, de las preguntas. Las preguntas las vamos a, a aceptar cuando levanten la mano a la final, al final de la plática. Y en Facebook también pueden hacer este, preguntas y yo se las voy a leer directamente a Eli. El día de mañana va a estar todo esto este, con subtítulos en español en YouTube. Entonces, este, para los que no sepan mucho inglés y quieren igual hacer una pregunta en español o lo que sea, se pueden quedar y mañana pueden ver toda la traducción. Well, with further ado, please, Eli. Uh, Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. Um, really, really happy to, to be presenting today. Uh, so it's been a while since I've, I've uh, actually uh, done one of these talks. So if I'm stumbling around a little bit, I apologize. Uh, just a little bit of background about who I am. Um, I'm a, obviously a, a shark diver, shark behaviorist. I was the former editor of Shark Diver Magazine. Uh, we published the magazine in 2000. We started publishing in 2003. Uh, we published uh, uh, 25 issues. We did uh, for for eight years, and uh, it was during this journey that I uh, truly got to to learn a lot about sharks. Being the 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 editor of this magazine, where you know we learned a lot. I learned a lot about shark behavior, about you know from different species of sharks, because you know obviously there's 500 different uh, types of sharks out in the world, and and you know just how different each and every one of these sharks are. Um, it was during this time that I, uh, while I was the publisher of these magazines, one of the ways that we were funding the magazine was we began organizing expeditions to different places and we would take people with us. And one of the places that we started visiting in, in the very beginning, which was uh, Tiger Beach. Uh, Tiger Beach is, is kind of been the the area where I truly, truly began to understand shark behavior and, and how, they, how sharks interact with people, how sharks interact with each other, how sharks communicate with each other. Uh, and it was during this, you know, visiting this place and, and visiting it different times throughout the year and, and actually working with the same sharks. You know, we've, we've seen some of the same sharks 
visit this location from from the very start. So 2003, 2005, when we were visiting and we were um, getting a lot of the same tigers, a lot of the same lemon sharks showing up to these locations. And when I, you know, the more time we spent there, I started uh, working with the sharks a lot more. I put the camera down and we started taking a box down and we started feeding the sharks there. And it was during this time that I truly, truly got to understand and learn about sharks and shark behavior. So um, the tigers, the lemons, and, and then later on when the great hammerheads started showing up, uh, I was able to find out about how they, you know, how these sharks interact with each other and, you know, how, um, how they interact with us. And, and it was, you know, working with the different sharks there, like, you know, the, you know, the ones that we got to name Emma and, and Hook and, and seeing how when they would come into the box, you know, I, I, I was, I was able to not only, you know, we could tell the difference between the sharks, but we could also see um, the way they were working, you know, they, they would interact with each other where, you know, we, I could see that the, you know, some of the shark, the dominance between, from the larger sharks to the smaller sharks, the lemon sharks and the, and the tiger sharks. So we got to really see um, different personalities and different behaviors. And, you know, some sharks are shy. Some sharks are a lot more aggressive. Some sharks are, um, they're players. Uh, and, and it was just, a, for me, it was really exciting time time to to learn to document and to understand you know how these sharks behaved and and um so what what i learned obviously you know when people first started seeing what we were doing i was putting out a bunch of still photographs and what they were what they were saying was that what we were doing was tonic immobility well um with tiger sharks tonic immobility they don't really go into tonic immobility um, they do relax. They do allow themselves to relax for you, but it's not a true, it's not true tonic immobility. So the images a lot of people are seeing were images like this, where, you know, I had the, the, the sharks going upside down or, or vertical and they were saying, you know, we're putting them to sleep. Well, well, you can, you know, you can do that with smaller sharks like reef sharks, but with larger sharks like tigers, they don't actually go into true tonic like other species of sharks. So like working tonic immobility, like you see this, I'm putting this dusty in the tail tonic, where you flip her upside down and she goes, she can go limp. And depending on how long you know, she'll stay like that or she'll eventually uh, wake up and, and swim off. <laughs> well, the reason behind it is because we have sharks, uh, the, the reason the tonic immobility is because of mating. Is sharks, the male sharks will grab the females by their fins or by their tail fin. And what they do is they try to, to, to tail twist and, and it'll relax the female sharks so that the male sharks can actually uh, mate with the females. And so here you see with these other sharks where he's actually doing that. He's trying to grab her tail, he's trying to twist it to cause her to go limp so that she'll be more receptive to his advances in that mating. You'll see her in here as you'll see this in here. Just... The idea is for her to flip upside down so that he can mate with her without. The whole point is so that you don't do it so that the males don't do a lot of damage to the females when they're trying to mate because most of the time, for the toothier sharks, they bite them. And, and they hold on to the females that way, and it's a lot rougher. But what we're seeing here is, is obviously that, that the shark is just a lot, very receptive to the male, and which should allow him for the allow him to mate. I see with the, with the tiger sharks, you know, the tiger shark is, they don't go into two Oh, hang on. I can barely hear you. Oh, I see. I'm okay. I apologize. The video is very loud. Okay. Um, man, let me see how to how I can do that. Uh, just use the volume of your computer. The which one? The volume of my computer? Yeah. Just lower it a little bit. Lower it so it doesn't matter. Uh, 
you can lower it up. You can bring it up after the, the presentation if you want. Okay. Well, but but then can you hear me talk while the video is playing or? Yes. I can barely hear you. That's why I'm asking you to lower the volume of the computer. Oh, no, that, that's fine. I apologize. If, if, if I can lower the, the, so you don't hear the audio of the water and you yeah. can still hear me, that work? Yes. Yeah. So you can hear me? Yes. Okay, let's see. Perfect. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Much better. I move this a little bit forward to pass the desk back to the Tigers. I can go through that little piece again if you guys didn't hear what I was saying. So what I was talking about with the, with the sonic immobility where the female relax to the point the male grab and go through it and the female will relax to the point where they're really set up the canary. Yeah, and it's can you hear me now? Did I do something? Oh man. When uh when, when you have the audio for the for the presentation it, it just blocks you off. Okay, then what I'll do is I'll play clips of the video and then I'll and then, then I'll talk about it. Yes, that's what I did. Okay. All right, then we'll do that. Okay, so with with tonic mobility with 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 the different species of sharks, you know, they all they all respond to 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 tonic differently. Whereas where I'm tail grabbing the dusky shark and I flip her upside down, that's a that's a form and and nor, the reason why nature has done this for sharks or allowed this for sharks is because in the shark world the mating is extremely violent and to keep from hurting the females too badly they they tend to go into they get they go into tonic which will allow the males to 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 mate with the females without hurting them uh, and without being too rough so what i've seen with the tiger sharks when we when i've worked with the tiger sharks is we're seeing a, a little bit, it's a little different when it comes to uh, how the tiger sharks mate with, with, uh, with, with, with the females and the, the, the males and the female tiger sharks because tiger sharks are extremely violent. I mean, when, when you see a female come back from, from, from mating, she's very, very beat up. She's scarred up. She's got chunks of fins missing. So we're, we're talking about um, very, it's a very violent courtship. And so what the tonic does, is it allows the females to relax so that the, they can be a lot more receptive to the males without hurting themselves too much uh, or without getting hurt in the process of the mating. And so what, I, what I'm trying to, what I was trying to figure out with why the tiger sharks are receptive to my touch is they're because of their, their ampullae of Lorenzini. So underneath the seven senses that sharks have uh, for, for, uh, you know, which is taste, touch, uh, sound, sight, uh, hearing, uh, and then they have the lateral line. They have the sixth, which is lateral line, which which detects vibrations. So the lateral line runs across the side of the sharks, and then they have these um, um, very sensitive uh, pores on their nose and and uh, throughout their face, called the ampullae of Lorenzini which detects uh, the electrical signal that, that all life forms give off. Well, when you manipulate that, it allows the sharks to relax. And some of the sharks go into complete tonic like we do with these, with the, with the, when you flip them upside down or you grab them by the tail, the ampullae of Lorenzini and certain species allows sharks to go asleep. But with sharks like tiger sharks, they don't. They go, they get really relaxed. And if I've seen different behaviors happen when I'm, when I'm manipulating the sharks like that. They tend to um, relax and allow me to either pick them up, and I'll show you in this next video, where they...
and that that, that behavior that that behavior that, that I've been seeing or the behavior that, that we started seeing with them was they, they started the tigers first started allowing me you know they got really relaxed and you know actually me rubbing my hand over the mouth is not something I do very often but you know the the, the tiger sharks are especially that tiger that I was working with uh, I've been working with her for more than 10 years She's showing me different sides of her where she's completely relaxed and I felt safe enough to do it. I don't always do that because I, I never forget what they are and what they're capable of. Um, but then it went from rubbing their faces and having them relax for me to, to being able, like on that last bit, uh, cliff where they started rolling. When I first, I first didn't quite understand why they, they were allowing me to roll or why the tiger shark's rolling in my hand. The first time it happened, it just completely blew my mind. I mean, it was just something I wasn't expecting. I really had no idea that, you know, that that was even possible. Um, and then after that, I was able to do it more and more and more when I started figuring out what it was or how to get them to roll or how to get them to go vertical. And it was just, you know, the different behaviors that, that I was seeing with them. And, and based on the personality, some tigers would allow it more than, than others would. Um, but it, but it had to do, I felt it had to do a lot of trust because some of the sharks that I worked with and the ones that I've been working with for year after year after year, I could see that they were allowing me to roll them more than, than the ones that, that I didn't know as well. And so I, I really feel like it, it had to do with trust, comfort, and, and also um, when, I, and, and for lack of better words, because I don't, I still truly don't understand why they roll, but but when a tiger shark hunts or when a tiger shark feeds, uh, they they when they bite their prey, they tend to to completely roll and twist their bodies. Whereas other sharks, they they jerk side to side when they grab prey. They do side to side motion. Whereas the tiger sharks, they spin because and that's based on their teeth design, the way that you know that they break off turtle shells and and uh, and such. So I feel like because of that behavior is why um, a tiger will spin and roll in my hand uh, compared to other species. But, you know, always what I see when, when I'm working with these, when, when I'm working with the different tigers is it's always a very relaxed, you know, they're very, they don't show aggression. They don't show um, like uh, that they're, um, I don't feel any malice towards me whenever I'm doing it. So like in this, in this video, <laughs> Oops, sorry. In this video before I play it, so the tiger shark comes in, she's jaw popping, she's opening her mouth, but it's still very, very relaxed motion. Even though it seems like she might be, you know, showing aggression, she's not. It's just more reflective. It's re uh, reflexive is what she's doing when, when, she's, when she's doing that. So let's show that. <laughs> So that's just that's just her extremely relaxed coming in, rubbing her, her rubbing her, her nose and, and she's responding to it. And one of the one of the critiques I've always that, you know, I'm forcing them to do this. Well, I don't, you, you can't force a, a, a you know an eight hundred pound tiger shark to do anything she doesn't want to do. You know, I've you know, when these sharks don't feel like rolling, there's nothing I can actually do physically to force one of these big sharks to roll. This is just them allowing me to do that and you know that's the that's the the continued mystery of why uh why this happens and why why these sharks are actually allowing these types of interactions to happen um it's still just something that uh, you know i want to learn and i want to understand better so here on this, this next one is emma and this is our the reigning queen of tiger beach she's She's pushing, maybe pushing 14 feet. She, when she's pregnant, she's way over a thousand pounds. And she is, you can see here when she comes in, she is completely relaxed and just allows these inter this interaction to happen. I mean, this is just her.
but you know, trying to understand why, you know, why it happens or why she's, you know, she allows these. And, and the only thing I can think of is it, it has to do with mating, whether it's, whether it's part of the courtship or part of, um, because when a, when a female is, is not interested in mating with a, with a male, what I, I've seen them do is, so most of the time how a male tiger shark grabs onto a female, they come up to the sides, either bite their fins, uh, their dorsal fin, their pectoral fin, or their tail fin. And usually I know when, I, when I've seen that, that, kind, that type of, of uh, mate, when a female comes in and she's got a really torn up a dorsal fin or tail fin, it just shows me that she's not receptive to the male because I put my hands on her back. And, and when I do that, when I put my hands on, on a tiger's back, so they'll actually physically try to buck me off or push me off of her. And, you know, because she's thinking or she's responding to me, like if I'm a male tiger shark trying to mate with her, the successful matings that I I'm gathering is when they're, when the females have, they're extremely bit up on the sides of their body, which means they've allowed the tiger shark, enough time to come in and actually grab on to the sides. They start out grabbing their fins and then they move to the sides of their body to where they can get a better grip of the, of the, of the shark so that they can mate properly. But other than that, I mean, I, you, you just see these females come in and their dorsal fins torn up or their tail fins torn up, but they have no scars on their sides. And then a week later, the shark shows up and she's all scarred up on the side, tells me that at first she wasn't receptive, but the males keep persisting and persisting, and finally the the the, the mating is successful, or at least I think it's successful. Um, but I that's the only thing I can attune to the actual relaxing and why a, a tiger shark would allow these kind of interactions to happen it has to do something with mating. Um, here, uh, this is a shark I've been working with. This is a shark named Freckles. Now this interaction is really interesting to me because these are this is as long uh, a type of slash tonic immobility that I'll be able to get out of a tiger. This is the one thing that as a tiger relaxes and she'll actually drop in the sand, they don't like, uh, they feel very uncomfortable laying in the sand. So you'll see her once, she'll relax in my hand and drop, but she will actually, the moment she feels the sand on her body, it'll just kind of wake her up and then she'll start swimming off. So here's three different clips of, of, of these interactions. And I was able to work with her longer because she was the only tiger shark in the area. That's the other thing. When I have multiple tiger sharks uh, around, they don't relax. They're always worried about the other tiger shark because of the dominance thing and the behavior thing that they, you know, the bigger tiger shark is always going to be the dominant player. And so the smaller tiger sharks never quite relax when the bigger sharks are around.
you know, just some behaviors that we're seeing, you know, the different behaviors with the Tigers. Um, great hammerheads through, through spending some time with the great hammerheads. It's uh, what I've learned is, is they're extremely, so their, their face, the, um, the ampullae of Lorenzini that you can see underneath the, their, their, their hammer right here, the underneath their face on that particular part of a, of a great hammerhead, it's extremely sensitive. And you know, that whole area is filled with uh, those little pores, those little uh, freckles I was telling you about that are filled with that ampullae of Lorenzini. And they use them kind of like a metal detector. So when they're trying to find their favorite prey, which is stingray, and most of the time they're hiding, the stingray is hiding under the sand. They use their cephalophore, or um, I think that's, I said it right, um, to hover above the sand and try to triangulate the position of that stingray that's, that's sleeping underneath the sand, underneath the surface. So um, what I discovered uh, through working with these sharks is once they find their prey, whether it's fish or if it's a stingray, they, they, what they try to do is they try to catch up to the animal and they use their, their head to actually magnetize to their prey. And what they're trying to do is once they magnetize to the prey, they're trying to pin it down to the sand. And once they get them on the sand, what happens is, especially if it's a stingray, the stingrays um, their fins, they tend to fold them up in a kind of a defensive thing. Um, and that's when the hammerheads will, you know, open their mouth and bite, bite their wings and try to, and try to eat their prey and try to finish off their prey before it escapes. But that magnetizing part is what I, what I found out or what I learned is how they catch their prey in this, in this video clip I'm about to show you. So uh, it was, I was, I'm really excited about this because I, I finally captured it this, uh, this past season um, where uh, as I was, as the hammerhead was passing by, I actually got her to magnetize to my hand and you can see her, they're actually, I'm showing this footage in slow motion, um, but it, what it is is she's just spinning around and what she's doing is she's trying to, to, to stay with my hand or, you know, what she's doing is trying to catch up to the prey so that she could actually pin them, you know, try to pin my hand down to the ground. But it's just a really, for me, it's exciting to see, you know, this is part of how they hunt. This is part of their hunting strategy. So I'll show that, that, uh, that footage real quick. Oops. Shoot. Anyway, that was, uh, so that was her actually magnetizing to my hand. And, and then at the end, towards the end, she just kept getting closer and closer to my body. So I put my other hand to kind of, so I could safely, you know, move my hand out of the way and let her, and let her, and guide her off so that she could keep swimming. Um, just, just super exciting to me that, you know, to be able to, to, to have that footage and, and to be able to share. I mean, actually, we slowed the footage down, but it, it really, I mean, it is fast when, when it happens. And uh, just, you know, super, you know, I was pumped. <laughs> uh, communication. So one of the, so how sharks communicate, that's always been a really fascinating thing for me is trying to figure out how it is that sharks talk to each other. Um, through the years, I've, I've seen and witnessed different ways that they do this. I've seen this from whale sharks, and, and, it's, and which is really prevalent. And they've actually done some work uh, on, with the lemon sharks in Bimini of, of how they communicate. So one of the ways that, that they do, what, what they did was they did this, this study where they had these juvenile lemon sharks, and they put them in this, uh, this maze. And the, the sharks learned that if they went through the maze, they got to the end, they would be rewarded with a piece of fish. And the lemon sharks would go through the maze and, and had no issues. They push a button, 
and then a piece of fish would fall in the water and, and then they would eat it. Um, so they, these two sharks figured it out pretty quick. They went, they, they learned to go through the maze, push the button. And then, um, and then they took those two sharks, they put them in a shark pen. And then a couple of months later, they took them out, they put them back in the pen and the sharks knew what to do right away. And they went and they got the, they pressed the button, they got the food. The, the amazing thing was that they had a couple of other sharks in the tank or in the shark tank with the other lemons that had been through the maze. These other sharks had not been through the maze. And when they put those sharks in the maze, those sharks knew exactly what to do. They went to the button, they pressed the button and they were, they were rewarded. So the sharks in the pen actually communicated what had happened, which is, which makes a lot of sense to where, you know, where we've seen whale sharks communicating where, the whale sharks used to aggregate, the large aggregation of whale sharks used to spend all their time in the waters around Holbush Island in the Gulf of Mexico. However, the food in, near the Isla Mujeres in, in the Caribbean Sea was a lot better. There was a lot more food, there was a lot more abundance. So for years, we used to see the large aggregation of whale sharks in the Gulf of Mexico, but all of a sudden, the majority of them disappeared and they all went to uh, Isla Mujeres and started feeding in the, in the waters of the Caribbean Sea, which told us or told me that that the sharks are communicating and, and letting each other know where the better feeding grounds are where there's more food there's more abundance of food uh lemon shark and so what i'm and, and this video i'm about to show you is me giving a, a shark a back rub and how i learned that these sharks are communicating is uh i was i was i started giving one particular shark a back rub where i was rubbing her back and she and after a while uh I, I started working with her at the beginning of the week, but by the end of the week, I had other sharks asking for a back rub, which I'd never worked with before. And so the only way that these sharks would actually understand that is if um, they had communicated to that one shark and then passed on that knowledge and then the other sharks were coming up and allowing me to give them back rubs. So there, there was some shark communications there. Now, uh, this video. <laughs> Sorry, I messed up. So, okay, really quickly, in this video, I'm giving the shark a back row, but what you're gonna see right now is there's gonna be a lemon shark in this background right here, and she is going to swim over, and she's gonna come up and purposely swim on top of the shark I'm giving a back rub to. And what she's doing is she's trying to understand why I'm rubbing on this shark, so as this shark passes by, she's going to download information from the shark to try to figure out what emotional state this shark is in. This is how they communicate. So. So that was the shark communicating. That was the shark um, trying to find information. So as you pass by the other shark, he's actually downloading information or trying to figure out um, what it is that the shark is feeling. Um, did I lose signal? Just want to make sure. Is everybody there? All good. Everybody still <laughs> okay? Just making sure. Um, okay. I, you know, I, I didn't even ask. I don't even know. 730. It's already 740. How long is, is this talk for? Because. It's usually for an hour and then questions and answers. Okay. Okay. Then I still have time then. But, yeah, okay. But feel free. If, if, if it's interesting, we will just continue doing it. <laughs> okay. Just making sure. I okay. just wanted to, to, to make sure that we're still. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. still going. Okay. No 
Actually, you have uh, 24 here, and in Facebook, we have like 20, so. Okay, okay, great. Then, all right, then I haven't put everybody to sleep yet. Okay, mm -hmm. or maybe they are asleep, they forgot to turn their computer off. <laughs> um, okay, and so this, so this, so this kind of, uh, this, this communication or this form of communication is, and, and this uh, with lemon sharks has is, is been really, really exciting and fascinating for me because I really feel like lemon sharks are possibly one of the most intelligent of the shark species. And, and what I'm seeing through them, uh, through working with these sharks is also um, where they're actually enjoying the interaction. And, and I'm, you know, obviously we, you, we use bait to attract the sharks uh, we, and we, we, we have food that brings them to the area. And I mean, I'm not under any illusions that, that um, these sharks are there for the food. You know, but you know that's that's how we actually get to work with these sharks to begin with. But while they're there, I mean, they're also showing us signs of of uh, seeking out attention, laying down so that we can give them back rubs. Like this video I'm about to share right here, where a shark comes up and she just rubs up against me because she's looking for she wants me to pet her, um, and that you know, but it just it surprises me. But this is the the kind of the stuff that we're experiencing with these. Animals. So yeah, I mean, it, it's just, I mean, it, I have to remember that it is a shark and that, you know, she does have teeth and that if I do something stupid, I am going to get bit. But at the same time, they're showing me another side and, and that's what, you know, I try to come across or I try to, to reach across when I'm, when I'm talking about these animals is that I do see um, a shark that, that is interested in interacting with us and, and which is really exciting because with lemon sharks, this is something that we don't see with any other uh, shark species where um, they do, they'll, I, I mean, I've had lemons like stick their face, you know, between my knees so that I can give them back rubs. I mean, there's just a really, really exciting, really interesting behaviors that we're, we're seeing from this species. And I, I feel like this is, this is that one shark that, that truly does reach across and is trying to interact and trying to show us that she can interact. Um, so before I start this, what I, I'm showing is, how I have a couple of the of our of our the dogs in my backyard, and how they they compete for attention. You know, one is if I'm petting one, the other one wants attention. If I'm petting the other, the other one wants attention. So uh, I messed up. Let me see. Oh. The reason I show that is because my lemon sharks show the same thing. So, and I'm not sure if it's a, you know, and, it, and, and it's hard, you know, because you don't want to enter a more, ah, I'm going to butcher that word. Um, you want to well, put human emotions into it because I'm going to butcher the word. Sorry, guys. Um, whereas the lemon shark is pushes the lemons push the tigers away so that to try to steal my attention away from 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 the tiger because they know I'm going to try to pet the tiger but the lemon sharks will cut him off and get in his way or push him completely out of the way which I've seen several times where they cut the tiger off and they move her away now one of the things is is she moving him away from the bait which is in the box in the little milk crate or is she moving away from us or from myself and that's that's what we're trying to figure out.
And here you'll see where it, she'll physically just completely push the tiger away from the bait box, away from me. And it looks like she's, this shark is, is trying to shake my hand off her nose, but what she actually likes, she likes to feel my glove in her hand, in her face, so she throws her head back and forth. So as you see her shaking her head, it's because she just likes the feel of my glove in her hand. So it's it's this it, this kind of this is the behavior that I'm that I'm really I mean for me it's 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 been the most uh, enlightening and the most rewarding uh, doing all the work that we have and learning the different behaviors from the different species of sharks and and trying to figure out um, how they interact with us how they interact with each other um, but you know just with lemon sharks especially just trying you know trying to understand. Um, how you know how it is that they're reacting to us i mean and, and there's parts of me that wish i could be out there every day for a year straight because i know that it would reveal so many different behaviors um that we've never seen before or that we've met anybody's ever witnessed before just because you know there's i mean just for the little windows that i've been able to to open up with these sharks uh you know seeing seeing uh, the things that i've seen or, or experienced it's just been mind-blowing stuff you know for me especially because a lot of this is so brand new uh you know here having this lemon shark lay down in front of me um you know and she just kind of was pushing herself she just kept pushing her face up against my knee and it was because she was requesting or asking for a back rub <laughs> And here, which really, which is fun, 
because I'm giving two at this, when this lemon shark just swam off, I was giving, actually I'm giving two back ropes to two different lemon sharks that were laying side by side. This nurse shark came in and bothered the position of this lemon shark. So she just swam off to, sw she's going to swim back around to reposition herself so that she can continue with her back rope. So it's just, just, it just for me, it's just exciting, exciting stuff. Um, the other thing about learning about shark behavior, it's helped me sense, you know, when a sharks want, want to misbehave. So part of my job when I take people diving or when, I'm, when I have people in the water with me is, you know, it's exciting for me to show people sharks and, and, and how they behave and how they interact and the different things that we can do. Um, you know, the different ways that sharks enjoy interactions. Um, but it's also, uh, the other part of it is keeping people safe because the one thing I don't forget and I never, I, I never forget is that I know what sharks are. I know what sharks are capable of. And I never forget that part of it. I never forget that these are apex predators. I never forget that, you know, if, if I make a big mistake, if I make a mistake, I can get hurt or, or even worse, somebody that I brought in the water with me one of our guests can get hurt. So the other, you know, the other thing that this has allowed me to do is, is learn how to watch sharks and watch and see when, when, a, when a shark is misbehaving or when I think a shark wants to misbehave. So it's, it's allowed, you know, and, and thankfully, um, you know, knock on wood, you know, we've been, you know, very, very fortunate, you know, that we've been able to, to make sure that the sharks behave because I mean, an accident, you know, one thing is, you know, that, it, you know, if it happens to a person, it's one thing, but, you know, because of the accident, sharks are going to get a bad or even worse reputation. Uh, and that's the last thing in the world I want. I, you know, I want our sharks to, to be safe. I want our people to have experience, uh, you know, positive experiences with these animals. And, you know, everybody gets a story, everybody goes home. And that's the whole thing. And so being able to see this before any kind of, before a shark decides to misbehave or, even if he's not going to misbehave, you just want to make sure that everything is, you know, really safe. And so like in this example, one of the things that we tell divers or we tell people when they're in the water is if you're going to return to the boat, you swim low to the ground and then, and then you get underneath the boat and you go straight up the boat. Because what happens is tiger sharks are extremely, uh, they're, they're like a, a dog. And if they see a squirrel, they, you know, they're, they're, they, they, it catches their attention and they're going to follow it. And so we ask people not to swim at a diagonal, in a diagonal position back to the boat because a uh, tiger shark might turn around, see you and follow you up. And this is what happens in this case. And thankfully, um, I was there to, to just make sure that Hook was behaving herself and that everything was going to be fine and fun. So there I just diverted a uh, hook from actually doing anything, being uh, uh, not behaving properly and, and uh, everything worked out really well. On this, this next video, the, the visibility was starting to drop and we were starting to, conditions were starting to get uh, pretty bad. Um, this was at the tail end, so what happened, we had really nice visibility, but low tide rolled in and then when low tide comes in, sometimes it brings in really murky, dirty water, the cold water that comes in. Uh, and just kind of dirty things up. Anyway, we had, we had a tiger shark. When that happens, the current also dies. And so we had some bait in the water, but the tiger shark couldn't find it. So what happens in, in those situations is tiger sharks start swimming around, trying to find the scent, because they know there's bait in the water, they just can't find it. 
So they start swimming in between the divers. And one of the things we do is we teach everybody how to safely push a tiger away if a tiger gets too close. That's something that they learn when, you know, when they're on one of our trips. But this one, this, this tiger came in. And, and another thing that happens a lot is we have our photographers who tend to take pictures. They get completely fixated on their cameras. So they're taking pictures and then they go straight to the histogram or they start looking at their image and they, you know, start changing settings. This is what happened in this case where one of our, our shooters was in the water and he lost sight of the tiger, took a picture and started fumbling with his camera and the tiger snuck up behind him. And, you know, just, I always tell people, eyes in the back of your head, so. So you actually, you actually uh, saved that diver right there. <laughs> well, the tiger, I mean, she may have not have done anything. She may have done, you know, nothing at all. But the, the whole point is to make sure that she doesn't. You know, the, you, know you want to keep the animal safe. You want to keep the people safe. And um, 90, you know, 95, 98% of the time, she's going to do nothing. It's that 2% that we're always looking out for. And we just want to make sure, because like you could see, she didn't open her mouth. She didn't do anything, you know, that aggressive. But, you know, she was, she was definitely, you know, you want to make sure that, that nothing happens. And that's the whole point. You know, you want to, you, you, you stop the accident before it happens. You don't want to find out what she's going to do. So. If, if I'm going diving with sharks, I'm going with you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that was, that was what I had for you guys, man. Um, I don't know if you want to open it up to, to questions. I, you know, I don't know you want to see something again that I went too, too I fast have, on or. I have a question, Eli. Yes, sir. Do, do sharks communicate with their own species or do they communicate with any shark? I, for sure, they speak with their own species. Um, I want to, uh, they, I want to say yes. I think they, there is some kind of communication that happened. There has to be. Um, I think it's different. I mean, maybe it's just a, you know, a different language that, you know, they may not know the, the dialect, but, you know, a shark is a shark. And I, and I really feel like they, you know, when a bigger tiger shark jaw pops uh, and, and you see one of the smaller sharks kind of scoot off, I, I think you definitely um, – can see, you know, how they, you know, that they communicate something to each other or, and, and you know what? Absolutely. Yes. Because I, I witnessed once where a lemon shark was swimming by a great hammerhead and it just looked like the lemon shark was swimming. They were maybe six, seven feet apart from each other. And as a lemon shark swam by all of a sudden, I just saw this great hammerhead just swimming really frantically doing figure eights, just really, really, really fast. Like if the lemon shark said something to the great hammerhead and the great hammerhead was showing its strength and power, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. There was some exchange that happened there. Um, so I have to imagine that, that yeah, they, they did, that something was spoken or some, something, unspoken words, I guess. Okay, we have a bunch of questions from Facebook. Okay. Uh, Annie Pimentel is, is asking, How usual is to find a shark in a noc nocturne diving at night? And is it true that yellow attracts sharks? You can definitely see sharks at night. I mean, we do a lot of night diving. We'll do uh, tiger shark dives at night. We do, I'll do some feeds at night, depending on how many tigers show up. Um, you know, we just, you know, that just depends on how, how um, what kind of diver you are. I mean, if you're really excited about seeing a, Uh, a shark at night will show you one. Um, as far as uh, yellow, well, sharks sharks are pretty much, they're colorblind. 
But what they do, they see contrast extremely well. They give up their daytime vision for better nighttime vision. And what that does is it bumps up their contrast. So they see um, like the, the, where the word yum yum yellow came from was they, they see bright colors differently than they'll see dark colors. And so it tends to attract their attention. So it doesn't, and like you can have a black object on, on, a, on a sandy bottom and it'll attract the shark because it contrasts uh, against the sandy bottom. So they'll see the black and they'll be attracted to it. But they'll see something, you know, a bright yellow or a bright pink or really, really, really blonde hair. And, and you'll definitely see a shark um, attracted to it. And that's just because of the contrast. You know, so, yeah. There, there is some of that. Okay. And uh, if you can share us your, your work, we can, uh, there's a bunch of people that want to know where they can reach you because they want to dive with you. Okay. Um, SDMdiving.com is our website. Um, SDM, the acronym for Shark Diver Magazine, SDM. Diving.com is our website, and you can find that. That's our Instagram and our Facebook. SDM Adventures is our is our Facebook. Um, so yeah, you can see us there. You can send me a. You can DM me, and and um, I'll, if you got any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer it. Um, okay. We have a, a podcast. I have a couple of questions. For, I actually I have some uh, questions from me. Uh, the the tiger sharks are the. The, the second deadliest shark, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Or is it the white shark? The white shark, it's, uh, it's a little bit dumber. Is that correct? No, no, they're extremely intelligent. Um, well, you got, you got the, three, the three deadlies. And the only reason you got the, 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 the tiger shark, the, great, uh, the, the, the white shark, and the bull shark. And the only reason is these are extremely large sharks. Oh, excuse me they're extremely large sharks and they tend to spend a lot of time in areas that people do. So they spend a lot of time near shorelines in murky water. Um, and just, just in areas where people tend to spend a lot of recreational time, which is why you'll always see, um, you know, uh, surfers getting in trouble with white sharks, uh, in places like Australia and California. It's because, you know, we tend to spend our time in the water where these sharks are also hunting, looking for their, their main prey looking for their, their, their food source, which is for, for white sharks, it's uh, their favorite prey or what their specialized specialty is, is seals and sea lions and, uh, you know, elephant seals. Uh, whereas tiger sharks, uh, turtles, uh, sea turtles are, are, are what tiger sharks, that's their specialty. So every shark has a niche in the ocean. Every shark has a job. And these sharks tend to spend time in, in, in areas that we do as well. Okay. And I, I, I also heard that uh, lemon sharks, they, they, they carry their babies uh, like kangaroos. Is that correct? Or? Well, they, they give birth. They give live birth. So they, they carry their babies until term, and then, and then they'll just start pupping out the babies, and they usually go to an area, like, which is why they, Bimini created the Bimini Shark Station, uh, because that area is, is uh, an area where one of the lemon sharks Uh, where the lemon sharks have been giving birth for years. And so they have actual, uh, it's one of the longest studies of sharks in the world. I think they got 20, 30 years of actual uh, DNA and samples of sharks coming back year after year to give birth in these same waters. So uh, pretty fascinating stuff, but yeah. Okay. Anyone with another question? Alguien con una pregunta? Si tiene una pregunta en español, con mucho gusto yo la puedo traducir y se la puedo preguntar a, a Eli. We have uh, another from Facebook. Does the white, dice, does the white shark have, ¿qué es eso? Lorenzi 2? Yes, all all sharks do. The amp ampullae of Lorenzini, yeah, yeah that, that that same the that same uh, pores and uh, you know for to find because all life every everybody we all have electricity coming off of us and and that ampullae of Lorenzini um, is what they use to sense it and that's you know sharks have the seven senses and I think that that they use the ampullae of Lorenzini to help them find prey. I think they use it as part of their communication with each other. 
the, the same thing with their lateral line, that, that vibration that they feel. I think that's some, something to do with how they communicate with each other. I mean, I'm not really sure, but that's just, you know, cause that's extremely lost on me, but um, yeah, it's definitely part of, of, of their senses. I have a question from Adrian Zamora. I'm going to unmute him. Uh, Adrian, adelante. Sí, gracias. Um, amazing exposition. Congratulations, Eli. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Yes. Uh, first, how long does a shark live? So, okay, so that's, that's the trick question. So for years, people thought that like, sharks live anywhere from 20 to 100 years. Um, and then the Greenland shark, they just did a, a, a study where they found out that this shark could live upwards of, you know, potentially 400 years old, uh, the Greenland shark that they studied. So because of, you know, sharks like uh, the Greenland shark, they, I mean, they have extremely large livers, which helps them process and helps them clean out their blood and clean out disease. And they're just, um, these are a very, very long lived animal. So uh, because sharks have never, they've never been able to get a shark from birth to, to its death, like a great white or a tiger shark. You don't, they, they, nobody really knows how long sharks live. They used to think it was 50 years for like a tiger shark, but I think it's, I think it's much, much longer. I think, I, I think at least a hundred years. Um, the sharks that I know, I've, I've worked with some of the same tiger sharks for over 10 years. And in, in that time span, you know, maybe a few of them have grown to like a foot, a foot and a half longer than from when I met them to the size they are now. So if you're, if we're talking about a shark that, that, um, has only grown a couple of feet and the sharks have a potential like a tiger shark, you know, some of the longest, uh, the biggest tiger sharks, uh, ever recorded are almost 20 feet long. Um, so you're talking about a shark, if it can grow that big, how long does it take them to grow that long? And, and, you know, and, and once they reach a certain size, a lot of them really stop growing, they slow down, and then they just start getting wider and wider and wider, they just get girthier. So if, if, you, if they have that potential, um, I, I really feel like, you know, a lot of these sharks can live longer than 100 years, especially with proof like from a Greenland shark that definitely lives 200 plus years. Um, there's, there's, there's just so much there that we still don't know yet. Thanks. And second, um, you already said the how dangerous is a shark when you dive? Are they likely to attack? No, 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 absolutely not. I mean, uh, so one of the it's it's all about rules. When you're diving with sharks, you got to follow the rules, and every shark has its own set of rules. I mean, the the number one rule for all sharks across the board is a shark should never be allowed to touch its body, or touch touch its nose to any part of your body. So. Um, you, which, cause, cause you don't, cause sharks feel, they, they, they taste everything with their nose and with their mouth. I mean, that's how they, they find out things are. They don't have hands. So they gotta, they, you know, they gotta grab things or they gotta, they gotta bump into things and allow their, their, their nose to, to sense it for the smell or the taste and, or they mouth things because we're so fragile and, you know, these sharks are so tough and their teeth are so sharp. You just you can't allow a shark to do that. So you you what you don't want is is uh, an accidental bump to bite thing happening. So um, you know there's you just you got to follow the rules. You got to understand how sharks behave. You know the the, the different things that that makes a, you know a shark a shark, and um, and 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 then though they're the safest animals in the world to dive with. And you can dive with white sharks outside the cage with any species of shark in the world. It doesn't matter. Just follow the rules and they're all safe to dive with. I have another question uh, from Salvador Herrera. He says, uh, can, can white sharks survive in, in, in cal captivity? Well, how do you call it? Uh, captivity? Yes, captivity. Okay. Uh, well, they found out no. I mean, they, what they'll do now is um, they have these outdoor pens that they, they can keep a white shark alive for a month, maybe two months, if that, and, and then they have to release it because after that, the sharks, you know, they, they get completely messed up. And if, if, if um, they're, whatever their navigational, um, just whatever's inside the shark that, that makes a shark a shark, especially uh, an open ocean shark like, like a great white that 
that doesn't spend time like a coastal shark. So a coastal shark will spend its entire life in one area. And those sharks, they do a lot better in captivity than a pelagic species like a great white. So as of, as of right now, they have not been able to successfully keep a white shark alive in captivity, not longer than a month or two. So Another still trying, sadly, but. This is a question from Facebook. Okay. It says, Since it's mating season, when you interact with the females, have you ever encountered a male approaching your group? Are males more aggressive? Males are definitely more aggressive. Now, the, the, the crazy thing is that I've done way over a thousand tiger dives at Tiger Beach. I've never seen a male tiger there. Never? All the, all the tiger sharks that I've ever interacted with have all been females. Yeah. So we're not sure why. We know when the, when the researchers do their, their work around the area, when they do some long lining outside of Tiger Beach, they catch males all the time. But for whatever reason, the males just do not come into Tiger Beach. There's been a few boats that have seen a male here and there, but it's extremely rare, and which is, which is crazy because you get great hammerheads show up there. You get lemons and reef sharks, and you get both male and female of every species except tiger sharks. Is there like a special, like a special consideration if, if you see a male one? Do you have to go out of the water or do so? Or it's... No, 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 because the, 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 dive, the diving they do in Florida, they get tigers there sometimes. They do get males show up on those dives. But for whatever reason, they just don't get any males, you know, over in our area. But, you know. Eli, have you tried a female do what you're doing and see if male sharks come? <laughs> uh, uh, like a female diver? Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's female whatever, feeders. Whatever you are doing, make a female do it, you know, and see if. Make a female, female yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of female shark feeders that work in Bahamas. Um, but as far as I know, I mean, for whatever reason, the males just. I don't know. Okay. And are you the only one that pets the, the, the sharks? Or do you know someone else that pets the sharks? No, there's definitely, I mean, a lot of this. So there's a lot of different operators that work out of the, the area, Tiger Beach. Um, you know, they, everybody, uh, everybody does their feeding. Everybody does their type of interaction. You know, we, you know so um, there's definitely different feeders out there uh, been working with the sharks. So... We have a, a, a David Mendoza wants to ask a question. Okay. Adelante. Okay. Uh, uh, gracias. Sure. Um, what's the current population of the of this uh, species of shark? Uh, well, that that's the first one, and the second. Uh, what are we doing uh, as human beings to to educate people to to uh, well, you know, to to know about these behaviors of of the different species of sharks? Um, well, tiger sharks are listed as threatened. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's just a continued thing. I, you know, unfortunately, until the, the commercial shark fishing stops, um, we're, we're just going to see the, the, you know, the populations around the world on a decline. Thankfully, you have places like the Bahamas, which is a shark sanctuary. So it's one of the few places where we're actually seeing um, the population's growing, you know, and we're hoping it's going to stay that way. The, um, the, you know, some of the studies that they're doing is they're trying to find out if these sharks are actually leaving the Bahamian waters and which they are. So once, once a tiger shark leaves the Bahamas, uh, they go into unprotected waters and they're susceptible to, to over to fishing, to commercial fishing. While the shark is in Bahamas, uh, they're safe. And, and thankfully we're, what we're seeing is, is like the, the, the females, are actually coming into the, Baham the Bahamian waters to give birth. So at least we know that sharks like tigers and lemons that, that are in the Bahamas and giving birth in the Bahamas, that uh, you know, those babies have a chance, a real good chance of, of growing up and become, you know, and, and returning to the area and, and doing the same thing. Um, as far as you know, make, you know, helping people uh, to be, to, to be aware of what, of, of our sharks and what's happening to them. I mean, this is, this is the best thing that we can do. And, you know, is, is sharing the story, sharing the shark story. And this is why I do what I do. I mean, most of the time we've done it through, 
whether it's social media or I go to school programs or every opportunity that we've had to be on TV or in the newspapers, you know, that's the one thing that, that, you know, we try to share is, is what's happening to the shark populations. And, and then through my work, you know, that's showing the interaction, you know, is, is extremely important because it shows the other side of sharks. Most of the time, all people get to see is, is, you know, a scared or, or toothy shark or the, you know, mouth opening shots. But, when you show a kid uh, a shark wa actually laying down in the sand so you can give them a back rub, it completely blows their mind. And, you know, it blows everybody's mind, um, especially if they're a lay person or someone who's not a diver, who's never seen a shark in the wild, you know, because you're, you're destroying everything they thought they knew about sharks. Because at that point, now they know that everything they thought they knew is wrong. And so now they have to open their mind and say, okay, there's some, this is something new about these animals that I had never known before. So. Okay, we have another question. Gonzalo Montero wants to ask a question. Uh, Gonzalo, adelante, por favor. Gracias, Albert. Thank you very much, Albert. Eli, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting participation in this conference. Uh, my, my question is about, uh, is there any fatal risk uh, diving with bull shark or tiger shark as a advanced diver or as a beginner diver? No, absolutely. Again, it's it, it goes down. It goes back to following the rules of, of shark diving. You, I mean, whether it's a bull shark or it's a tiger or a great white, um, you 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 can safely dive with all these species as long as you know there's you 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 follow the you know the different things that you have to do for that particular species uh you know the um as as an advanced diver i mean really all as a, a beginner diver to an advanced diver the only difference is the amount of water time that the advanced diver has compared to the beginning diver but if neither of you have been in the water with the shark you still have to learn you know the same things about the shark behavior that you know an advanced diver versus a beginner diver so i take people that you know their their sea cards are still wet to on these shark dives because it 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 doesn't um it doesn't really matter because that person like a, you know a dive master who's never been in the water with the sharks still has to learn about shark behavior still has to learn how to behave around a shark um you know where to put your hands how to safely push away a shark i mean those are things that you have to learn um and it you know so it doesn't really matter your skill level i mean it helps if you have a lot of dive experience so you don't have to worry about your equipment when you're in the water but that's about the only advantage i mean other than that you still have to learn animal behavior yeah a question from facebook christian alvarado asks i have a question last year in playa del carmen mexico bull shark females arrived arrive late in the season me and my wife went to dive with them in wow. December, and we didn't see any. But after several months, a friend who works there told, told us that all of them came back. A lot of theories appear higher water temperatures, overfishing, magne magnetism, etc. Do you know something about this? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the, 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 the big thing with the bull sharks of Playa. They, they, um, so the sharks come in, they're following fish. The reason why the bull sharks are there to begin with in Playa, the reason why they come through the area is because a lot of them are pregnant. They move through the area. They, the, they're following their prey. I'm not even sure what species it is that, that they're following. Um, and they, they hang around the area for a few months and then they go off to the different estuaries to give birth or the ones that are not pregnant will go off and, and to go mating. Um, but it just depends on what is happening in the area. So sometimes um, what we've seen in the past is if a fisherman goes in there, catches one of the sharks, the sharks, when they're, as they're pulling the shark in, the shark starts releasing pheromones. And what, is, what the shark is doing is it's warning the other sharks that something is happening. And these pheromones are releasing into the water and it actually causes the shark, the rest of the sharks to scatter. And so these, this, this does happen quite a bit. So we've seen where, where they've caught and killed a shark and then the next day, the next few days, all the sharks are gone. Or we've seen 
um, something happening to the game fish population where the, all the fish have left early or the fish have gone somewhere else and all the sharks follow. So it, 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 it varies. I mean, I've been out there and the sharks are not there. Um, and then three days later, the sharks show up again. And then, you know, you come back and they're hanging around for two weeks and then something happens and we don't know what, and then the sharks take off again. That's just the bull sharks in the area, following the water, following the patterns, following the moon. I mean, it, it's a variety of things. And, and um, so it just, it just depends. It really is. Every season's different. Uh, next season, the sharks could be there early and stay there the entire time and not leave the entire time they're there. Just never know. Okay, another question. Uh, what happened? How did it happen that you be, you you became this uh, like how do you call this this relationship with sharks? How did all this begin? That was all of it was by accident. So it was more of when well, the way it kind of started at Tiger Beach was we went on one of the trips that we were out there, we were having trouble getting the tigers to hang around. They were just, they were super shy. They were kind of hanging out. Like we knew the tigers were there, but they didn't want to come in. So, and I was always down there with a camera. I was always down there filming and stuff. I said, you know what? I'm just going to leave my camera up here. Let me take some bait down. Maybe we can attract them in. And And that was it. That's kind of how it, it kind of birthed. That's how it all started. So I, draw, I brought the bait box down and I started feeding the tigers. And that's, um, that's kind of how it began. Now the relationship with these sharks evolved over time. The time that I was in the water feeding the sharks, um, you know, I was, you know, we're down there for an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. And it, it started happening to where um, I was watching their behavior and I was watching how the, you know, I'd start watching lemon sharks pushing tigers away. And, and I just started watching this game within the game, you know, that this, this kind of entire world opened up to me just by just sitting there and watching tigers coming in and watching when Emma, like Emma, one of the big tigers came in and princess, one of the smaller tigers. And if princess was around, we'd have her for two hours. And then all of a sudden Emma would show up and then princess would leave. And then, you know, that's so I got started like, hmm, what, what happened there? Like, what is going on with that? And so that just started opening up questions. And it would just, you know, so I started seeing this, this dance happening. And, and that's where these relationships started forming. And, and you know, I, we started going to Tiger Beach in 2003. And here we are 17 years later. And, and we're still seeing the same sharks there. And I'm still seeing different ballets and different dances. And now we're starting to see the offspring of some of the tigers that, you know, showing up at our area because we're seeing smaller sharks and they're coming into the bait box that, you know, we've never fed them before, but they, they act like they know what we're doing, they're doing. And so I can only assume that these are offspring of, of some of the, you know, the big females that have been coming in. So it, it's just, I mean, super exciting. And, 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 and it's a learning process. I'm still a student, you know, that's the one thing that I'm get real excited about is I don't know anything about sharks. I'm just a student and I'm always learning and, and I just hopefully one day, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll know enough to, to really, really get a, a true understanding of these animals. And you're the first one that started with all this feeding with the uh, tiger sharks. Is that correct? I don't know if I was the first one to feed them, but I was definitely the first to roll. I was definitely the first oh, to figure out the, oh, the rolling thing. Yes. Yeah, the first behavior, you know, that was definitely something that had never been done before, never been recorded. And, And, and the back rubs uh, as well? Back rubs, I think that was really, yeah, I, I believe so. You know, I mean, it's just, I mean, all of this was, because it's all brand new. The, the thing about shark diving, so when I first started the magazine in 2003, um, tiger shark diving was still kind of taboo. I mean, it was still like people were diving with tigers, but it was like, well, you could dive with tigers during the day, but you can't dive at night. And then people started diving with tiger sharks at night. Like, okay, well, you can dive with tiger sharks outside the cage but you can't do it with with great whites and then they started diving with great whites outside the cage and you know i mean so it was there was a lot of there was still a lot of not of of unknown with these animals and then in tiger beach really changed things because it's so shallow you're talking about water that's maybe anywhere from 40 feet to 20 feet deep so in that time in that area you have a lot of time to spend with these animals whereas You know, in different areas, you, you didn't have that before. And so we, you know, we're able to spend, you know, and, and spend 
year round with these tigers. The tigers are there all year round. So, I mean, you're talking about a lot of people spending a lot of time with these animals and, and learning a lot about behavior and things that we've never known before. Uh, you know, like for example, I mean, for, for a long time, it was, it was thought that, you know, shark dives, organized shark dives were not good laboratories to study sharks because we're changing behavior because we're feeding sharks. It's not natural behavior. So it doesn't make a good lab. However, you know, spending time out there, I watched these, uh, these female tiger sharks come in and one of the sharks that, that, that we worked with, her name is Tequila. She had two big bites taking out of her, out of her tail. And so they were like two big giant cookie cutter bites where, where one of the males ripped off her tail. And within a year, she grew all those ta that tail back, completely filled in. And that was something that was relatively unknown. And so, you know, this, this was something to me that was really exciting because it just proved how important these organized shark dives are. Not for showing, you know, not just to show people sharks and just say, oh, wow, sharks are cool but as living laboratories of, of things that we can learn off of these animals, like just new, new behavior, new science, new, new everything. You, you keep track of them because you, you see them all the time. So you, Absolutely. You see, you see the way they, they, they communicate or the way they, they perform. Or, well, one, uh, another question. Uh, this is a personal question. Uh, okay. have, have you ever been bit, bitten or oh, tried yeah. or a little bit or something? Uh, four, four times. <laughs> four times. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've uh, been bit by, I still have all my hands, but it's been feeding. So it's, it's, it's the, the, the thing that you got to remember is, is when it comes to, to sharks, it's, um, you're, we're also, we're feeding sharks. So anybody who works, like it'd be just like somebody who works with dogs, you work with dogs uh, a long time, eventually you're going to get bit. Myself and some of our other feeders, um, it does happen. So thankfully, you know, it hasn't been anything serious. Um, but yeah, I have, you know, I've, I've had accidents and it's always my fault. It's, you know, mi culpa. I'm, it's, I'm a hundred percent responsible for it. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a bunch of questions. Wait, let me, let me take the good ones. All right. Uh, Alice. I have a question. First, first of all, very interesting. Thank you. When mating, the, when mating, the male sharks are aggressive towards the female sharks. Yes, it's extremely aggressive. That's that's one of the things that where tonic, I believe, tonic immobility, um, is is why sharks will go into tonic immobility. It has to do with uh, relaxing the female to the point so that the males can mate with her without hurting the female badly. Because you see, we see it all the time in reef sharks and, and, and tiger sharks where they're just completely bit up. I mean, chunks of fins are bitten off, their dorsal fin, their tail fins, their, their pectorals. We see just big chunks out of great whites where they just take big chunks of flesh off of the females as they're, as they're, they're uh, trying to mate with the females. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely aggressive. And, and I think the, 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 uh, the tonic immobility allows this to happen without the females getting too hurt. Okay. Uh, another good question from Facebook. In Playa del Carmen, uh, the, the, the bull shark feeding, is it bad for the, is it bad for the, the sharks? They get accustomed to humans and, and just expect the feeding from the humans or or is it, does it influence something with the sharks? That, that's, that's been the biggest, you know, that's the, because you know, what, what people tend to do is, is they associate like land animals. Like they say, don't feed bears because bears are going to associate people with food. And same thing with, with, with wolves. And, and that, that does happen with land animals. However, with ocean animals, that doesn't happen. So a shark can be conditioned to visit a dive site or an area if it thinks it's going to be fed. Yes, you can condition a shark to visit, and, but they don't associate people with food. Sharks are, are very sense driven. So if, if they don't smell the food, they're not going to hang around for very long. So even though we're in the water, if, if there's no food, there's no bait, there's no scent, 
If the food's not there, the shark is not there. They will leave. And there's plenty of, there is a lot of documented uh, proof to this, which is like um, Stuart Cove. So Stuart Cove has been doing this dive with the reef sharks for 30, 40 plus years, somewhere around there. I think it's more like 40 years now, where they go every day to the same area and they feed the sharks there. Well, when they jump in, they do two dives. So the first dive, they jump in, there's no bait. They're just swimming around. And then the, the divers are in the water. They'll see maybe one, maybe two, um, sometimes 10 sharks hanging around the area. But the sharks are always in the distance, are always kind of hanging around, but they're not really coming in close. On the second dive, when they see that feeder coming in with the tube and, and they, the, the scent hits the water, boom, you know, 50 sharks all right there, all hanging out. You know, so if that were true, where were all the sharks before? They knew there was no food. There was no scent. So the sharks don't want anything to do with the people. I mean, if, if it were the opposite, then the minute that everybody jumped in the water, boom, all 50 sharks would be on top of the divers thinking, do you have food? Do you have food? Do you have food? No, they're all scattered. That's right. So, and, it, and another place that, that we did that was um, in Unexo, there's a, a dive site where they've been feeding the sharks there for 40 plus years. And they have their dive site. They have this area where they've been feeding. We went over there. We were about maybe a couple hundred yards away, which is maybe two football fields away from where they feed their sharks. We anchored our boat and we were there and we put a bunch of chum in the water. And we would think because we had, because they've been feeding sharks in that area for so long, all the reef sharks would come to our boat and then we'd have them all over us and we'd be feeding them. The opposite happened. Reef sharks are used to feeding in this one spot, but because we were over here, you know, with our bait over here, um, the reef sharks didn't come over and were trying to feed. They, they treated it. They, they, they went back to being uh, shy sharks they went back to behaving like their normal shark behavior because they didn't know our boat they didn't trust us they didn't trust the area just because there's food in the water doesn't mean that they were going to come right in because they had no idea what we were doing or why we were there so they went back they returned to being shy curious you know shy sharks that were staying out in the in the peripherals or staying away from us until they got comfortable before they would come in so it's just it's just something that, yeah, you know, there's just a lot of proof that says, no, that doesn't happen. Okay. There's uh, uh, Lucia wants to ask a question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, good question, please. When we go diving, uh, we are told not to touch giant mantas or whale sharks because they have like a layer that protects them against parasites. Is that correct or not? And is it okay to touch the rest of the sharks? You, you, wherever you go, you, you have to respect the local rules. Um, I mean, the, the reason we're, we're very hands-on at, at, at Tiger Beach is, is because uh, the area, this is, a, this is a feeding dive. This is a, you know, there's an area. And we teach people to, to defend yourself if you've got a curious tiger shark. So we ask them to push them off. And, you know, we, 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 we ask people not to touch the sharks. We, we feeding them, we're touching them. But um, when you go to a different area and they ask you not to, to touch the whale sharks or the manta rays, it's more because they're looking at, it's not just you that wants to touch them, but if you've got, you know, a bunch of different dive boats out there, you're going to have a lot of people wanting to touch this animal, uh, potentially spooking it off. Um, that layer that they're talking about, that, ha that, that protective layer is more for like other species of fish. The, the, when I touch sharks, they don't, they don't have that, that slime layer like, like grouper does or other fish species do. They got, you know, they, the sharks have their, their shark skin is designed to allow them to, to move through the water silently. And so they got that really unique, um, you know, the, if you like, zoom in on on a on shark skin you got that really cool looking uh that almost uh sandpaper like feel to their skin um i think a lot of people say it because you know i mean it if they if if you tell people they got that protective layer it it, it helps keep people from touching the sharks <laughs> which you know which is great uh i, I think it just keeps the animals safe more than anything else you just you just got to respect the local rules and and you know the, the locals know better than anybody else so 
Okay, Eli, we have a question here from David Salinas. Uh, he wants to know how the sharks communicate between them. If it's if it's low frequency sound, or do you know anything about it? No, no sounds whatsoever. It's it. I think it's it's more. I think they send electrical signals to. They kind of like they they like send emails to each other or or. Um, uh, they just uh, they use Bluetooth or something. It's it's some form of telepathy. Uh, whether I think it's electrical signals. I think that's why they're so sensitive with uh, with their the ampullae of Lorenzini to be able to communicate with each other uh, or their their lateral line that picks up vibrations in the water. It's just something. It's something that people they still haven't figured out yet. But it's it's some kind of um, wireless communication. You know, for lack of better words, because just sending electrical signals to each other. Okay, and another question from Marcos is, if you know if you can train a lemon shark, like a dog? Like a dog. <laughs> they, I mean, you can condition a lemon shark to, to, to do certain things, but um, I don't know if, if, um, uh, if you can train one. I don't know. I mean, it's, I imagine, I would say yes, but I have yet to, to truly, um, I haven't spent the time, or I don't know anybody who has spent the kind of time with a particular species of shark that, or, or with a lemon shark that can say that, um, yeah, we've trained it uh, to do certain things. Now, now you condition like whale sharks with buckets in like the aquarium of, of Georgia, where they, they slap a bucket on the surface and the whale sharks come up and they know that it's feeding time. Um, they've they've uh, conditioned well they, you can they've trained nurse sharks in the pens to come up on the platform and then when they kind of do a hand signal all the lemon sharks or the nurse sharks uh swim off of the platform but in the wild i don't know i mean and definitely in aquarium settings yes so i imagine yes if you spent enough time with the animal it's possible okay uh pedro has a question adelante pedro uh, uh, hi Eli. Congratulations, this was a very good, uh, a very good presentation. I just want to make something clear about the training of the lemon sharks themselves. For many years, I worked in Cancun, and a part of my job was to train nurse sharks, lemons, and bonnet heads. I don't want to say that they were as obedient as, as a dog, but absolutely, yes, they were capable to learn, of learning a, a complicated, sophisticated behavior. So, uh, starting with a, well, all animals, in a way or not, they are going to be trainable. You just use open, open conditioning, positive reinforcement, and then and then they will they will follow your instructions. And uh, the way we were training the sharks back in the in the early two thousands, um, well, we got very good response from the from the nurse and the and the, uh, the lemon sharks as well. So trainable, yes, they, they they are trainable. Don't wait for them to roll and to bark and to beg. But they can station, they can they, they can sit, they can turn around, they can follow a target. Oh wow! Yeah, I definitely love to talk to you some more about that. When you know, on a on a later date, would love to learn some more about that. Absolutely. Oh great! Pedro, Pedro is our our marine uh, biologist, so he's always here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if we have more questions. Ben. Liliana is asking if uh, do the shark have a mission like ants? Yeah, to make more babies and and to feed and and uh, that's you know and just to be badass because they're sharks. <laughs> okay. But I mean, on that on that note, I mean, every shark has a job in the ocean. Every shark has a responsibility. So I mean, the one thing that 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 uh, you know the sharks perform their role in in the ecosystem so whereas um they're all specialists they have a specialty of some kind where like the the tiger sharks help control turtle populations the great hammer or the hammerheads help control stingray populations white sharks the seal populations you got makos that help control tuna and swordfish populations uh so you and you have the ground dwellers like you know the the, the, the horn sharks that help control sea urchin populations. So every shark has a responsibility in the ocean. Um, the bull sharks, we figured they're, they're so massive because they're shark killers. 
they help control shark populations. So they need to be big and that's why they don't get on well with other species of sharks. So pretty, uh, pretty exciting, you know I mean? As far as that goes. So yeah, they, they kind of do have a, you know, a purpose. Okay. Vic, Vic has a question here. Hello, everybody. Can you everybody hear me? Sir. Uh, well, more than a question, I have a statement. I want to say that uh, Eli Martinez is the best person you can go to meet a predator. I was lucky enough to go with him to dive to Banco Chinchorro to meet some crocs. And yeah. it was a time of, of my life. So if you are considering to go and meet uh, some sharks, definitely he is the person you want to go. Thank you, brother. That was <laughs> solicited. I did not promise. I was <laughs> it wasn't a question. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vic. Okay, no more, no more questions in the chat. So I think we are done over here. Okay. Uh, I think everybody, everybody loved your, your, your talk. Maybe you can schedule another talk for uh, not sharks, maybe anacondas that you went the, the other way. The yeah, other way. we can talk crocs, anacondas. We can, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm not, I definitely, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in it. And any of those animals, I mean, I, I was lucky enough to, to spend as many years as I have and as much time in the water that I have with these animals. And that's the reason why I feel confident about speaking about them the way I do is because I feel like I, I put in the hours to, to, to understand their behavior uh, a little better. And I've seen things that, you know, that I've been very fortunate and, and feel really blessed that I've, I've been able to, to do. Um, but, you know, we can, we can definitely talk about the, uh, some of the amazing wildlife that we get to experience on some of the other places. And, and uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Because everybody is is asking, please another one, another, another <laughs> conference, another. Absolutely, man! I would love to. Just let me know. Okay, and uh, thank you very much for being with us and sharing all your experiences and all your information. Because I think you're the the maximum authority in sharks that I know of. <laughs> yeah, no, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of really really great people out there that 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 know a lot. I'm. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I just speak from more from passion and, 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 and time in the water. Uh, that's, that gives me the, you know, the, I guess, like I said, you know, the, the, the confidence to be able to, to say what, you know, the things that I've said tonight and, and, um, but, you know, absolutely. No, there's, there's some great people. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know where to find uh, Eli? Again, if you can share us your, your contact information. Sure, it's um, uh, well on Instagram or SDM Diving. Uh, that's also our website, sdmdiving.com. Um, you can find me on, on, uh, on Facebook, SDM Adventures. Um, and uh, yeah, my personal page, Eli Martinez. And you know, I'm, I'm around. If you guys got on DM, you got any questions, be more than happy to, to answer anything anyone has to, to, to ask. And if uh, if you you can uh, you can mail me as well, and I'll I'll reach him. Uh, thank you very much for for your talk. Very interesting. I just want to remember everyone. Our next uh, talks first time in English then in Spanish. Uh, on Monday we have Leo. Leo on Leo Morales. He's an, uh, he, he lost a leg and he has a couple of uh, Guinness World Records and he's going for the third one. So that's going to be an interesting talk. And after that, uh, we have uh, Benja, Benjamin. He's a, a professional photographer. He's going to give us tips on photography. And on, on uh, the 14th of May is Pepe Vasquez. He's the director of Scuba Acapulco. He has the best stories. I don't know why. He <laughs> <laughs> and after that, on the 18th of May, we have Luis Sanchez. And his specialty is uh, rebreathers. And he's going to be uh, giving us a little bit of, of, of his stories with that. So thank you very much.
Thank you, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in. I truly appreciate it, man. Thank you, Eli. It was great. Oh, thank you. Bueno, gracias a todos por asistir. Este mañana se postea todo esto en YouTube y con con traducción al español abajo con subtítulos. Este buenas noches y gracias por estar todos aquí. Gracias Benja por acompañarnos también. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Good night. Bye. Keep safe.